So we'll read Acts 5, a couple of verses. We start at the beginning, so I'll read from verse 7. And it came to pass about three hours afterwards that his wife, Sapphira, not knowing what had happened, came in. And Peter answered her, Tell me, if ye gave the estate for so much? And she said, Yes, for so much. And Peter said to her, Why is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Lo, the feet of those that have buried thy husband are at the door, and they shall carry thee out. And she fell down immediately at his feet and expired. And when the young man came in, they found her dead, and having carried her out, they buried her by her husband. Verse 11, And great fear came upon all the assembly and upon all who heard these things. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders done among the, among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. But of the rest durst no man join them, but the people magnified them. And believers were more than ever added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women, so that they brought out the sick into the streets and put them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter, when he came, might overshadow some of them. And the multitude also of the cities round about came together to Jerusalem, bringing sick persons and persons beset by unclean spirits, who were all healed. And the high priest rising up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, were filled with wrath or jealousy, and laid hands on the apostles and put them in the public prison. But an angel of the Lord during the night opened the doors of the prison, and leading them out, said, Go ye and stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard it, they entered very early in the temp into the temple and taught. And when the high priest was come, and they that were with him, they called together the council and all the elderhood of the sons of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. And when the officers were come, they did not find them in the prison, and returned and reported, saying, We found the prison shut with all security, and the keepers standing at the doors. But when we had opened them within, we found no one. And when they heard these words, both the priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest were in perplex perplexity as to them what this would come to. And some one coming reported to them, Lo, the men whom ye put in the prison are in the temple, standing and teaching the people. Then the captain, having gone with the officers, brought them, not with violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And they brought them and set them in the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, We strictly enjoined you not to teach in this name. And lo, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and purpose to bring upon us the blood of this man. But Peter answering, and the apostles said, God must be obeyed rather than man. The God of our fathers has raised up Jesus, whom ye have slain, having hanged on a cross. Him has God exalted by his right hand as leader or captain and savior to give repentance to Israel and remission of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and the Holy Spirit also, which God has given to those that obey him. But they, that's the leaders, when they heard these things, were cut to the heart and took counsel to kill them. But a certain man, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor of all the people, rose up in the council and commanded to put the man out for a short while. And so then we have Gamaliel's counsel, and the conclusion of Gamaliel was, in verse 38, Now I say to you, withdraw from these men, and let them alone, 
For if this counsel or this work have its origin from man, it will be destroyed. But if it be from God, ye will not be able to put them down, lest ye be found also fighters against God. <coughs> and they listened to his advice, and having called the apostles, they beat them, and enjoined them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and dismissed them. They therefore went their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be dishonored for the name. And every day, in the temple and in the houses, they ceased not teaching and announcing the glad tidings that Jesus was the Christ. So far the reading of the scriptures. Just a, a little recap, we have seen um, so far that the Lord Jesus was with his disciples after his resurrection for 40 days, and then he was exalted in heaven at God's right hand, and then 10 days later he sent the Holy Spirit on this earth, and then Peter's message, after Peter's message there were 3,000 people saved. And then we have the beginning of the church in Acts 2. We consider that. And then in Acts 3, we have seen the miracle of this man who was paralyzed from his birth and he, he was healed. He put his trust in Peter's message and really through Peter's message he put his trust in the Messiah. And the lesson was, as Peter explained to the whole people, that as this paralyzed man had put his trust in the Messiah so the whole people could trust in the Messiah and be saved and walk in a, in a manner uh, to the honor of God but they rejected that offer of course there were a lot of people saved but the leadership rejected this offer because they didn't believe in the resurrection and then we have seen how Peter spoke again that this in chapter 4 that there is no salvation but in this name. But they rejected that message, they put him in jail, and then uh, they were released again, and uh, they were uh, beaten. And now, at the beginning of chapter 5, we have seen a new development. The opposition, and of course that's the work of the enemy, we realize that the, 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 the devil will not sit still. He, wants, he doesn't want God to be honored on this earth. So he had penetrated this leadership, the Sadduceans, they were in name serving God, but in actual fact they were servants of the devil. And so they didn't believe in the resurrection, they didn't believe in angels, and they persecuted the early believers. But then we see how Satan had another tactic when he could not stop the progress of this new testimony, he tried to corrupt it. And we have seen at the end of the last session that we had, that there was Ananias and Sapphira. We have seen Barnabas, at the end of chapter 4, who sold his property, because the believers in those days, they were poor, and they were in need of uh, help. There were many widows, and uh, they had sold the properties then to um, support those who were in need. And Bar Barnabas gave a beautiful example in this. And he was honored for this. And Ananias and Sapphira, they f thought, we also want to be honored. They were believers. Um, Ananias, his name means, uh, the Lord is gracious. And Sapphira means something like fair. They had beautiful names, but there was a problem with their uh, decision. They <coughs> pretended that they brought all the money of the property that was sold. And so this was a real attack of the enemy, to attack this new testimony, to corrupt it. If he could not destroy it, he would corrupt it. And that is the challenge here in chapter 5. And now we see how the early church uh, reacted to that. The Holy Spirit gave Peter discernment to see that this was a while of the enemy, that this was a form of hypocrisy. And we have seen then, in the beginning of chapter 5, how Ananias uh, 
<coughs> fell down dead. But Peter asked him this question in verse 3, Why has Satan filled thy heart? As a believer, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. But because he, uh, he was led by uh, some form of greed, and also by pride, because he wanted the same popularity as Barnabas had received, because he had sold his property and given it to the poor, and Ananias had therefore opened his heart to be filled, that is, to be controlled by Satan. That's the point in verse 3. And so he had become an instrument of the enemy. didn't mean that he became an unbeliever at the moment. A believer will always be a believer. But the point is, our hearts are our hearts controlled by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, or do we allow Satan to control us because of pride or because of greed? That's a challenge for all of us to have the right motives and to make sure that our hearts may be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And then we have uh, seen this uh, comment or these questions that Peter asked in verse 4, While it remained, did it not remain to thee? And sold was it not in thine own power? Why is it that thou hast purposed this thing in thine heart? So Peter challenges here the hypocrisy that was behind this whole plan. Um, it was very clear that if they sold the property and would give 50% for the Lord's work or for the poor and keep the rest, that would be fine. But they should men have mentioned it then. And everything would have been okay. Um, another thing I want to emphasize here in verse 4, in the middle of verse 4, they have been planning this. It was not just an accident. You can... Every believer can make a mistake and have an accident, and but this was pre-planned. They have been thinking about it, planning about it, scheming about it, and Satan had gotten hold of them. That is the point. And so they had lied against God, against the Holy Spirit. Now we have an expression here that is very uh, remarkable in verse 2, that he put aside for himself. Notice that. God doesn't want, he, he wants us to enjoy all earthly blessings that we can uh, re rejoice in. And, but if we have this attitude to have something for ourselves, in a very selfish way, then we really dishonor the Lord. The Lord has given us everything, um, money or good health or a house or a car, but it is to be used for His glory. And this is what Ananias and Sapphira did not do. They wanted something for themselves, for their glory. And that's important because if we have a talent, the flesh in us has the tendency to use it for our own glory and not for the glory of the Lord. So that's a lesson for each one of us to really consider our ways and see, am I using the gift that God has given me for His glory? Or do I, do I use it just for myself. And I repeat, God wants us to enjoy all the blessings that we have on this earth. But as stewards, to use these blessings for God's honor and glory. And then we will be happy at the same time. So that's a practical lesson for us. Another lesson is that this was the beginning of a new testimony. God had started a new testimony. And here was someone who put something aside for himself. And that reminds us of the people of God, the earthly people of God, Israel, when they entered the promised land and they had surrounded Jericho and then Jericho fell and then God had said through Joshua that they should not keep anything of Jericho. All was under the curse and all was reserved for God. And then there was a man, Achan, and he took something for himself. And in the Greek text this word put aside is the same thing, the same thought that Achan did in Joshua 7. Something taking that belonged to the Lord and keeping it for himself. That was a very serious matter. If we take something that belongs to the Lord and then keep it for ourselves. The other thing that we can learn from this, uh, or let me just read a few more verses and then I have a, a few uh, observations to make. <coughs> 
in verse 5, and Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and expired. Uh, there are people today who believe uh, you can be slain in the spirit. Well, here's an example of being slain in the spirit. He had light against the spirit, and the Holy Spirit, who is God himself, he made him fall down so that he expired. Literally, that means sold out. His soul went out. He breathed his last. Now, as a result of this, we see that great fear or awe came upon all who heard it. And that is understandable. Now notice, for his wife there was still the chance that she would recant, that she would repent of this uh, plot. And when she came in three hours later, she didn't know what had happened. We see in verse 8 that Peter asked the question, tell me if he gave the estate for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. So she was lying also. And Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together? So they had made a plan. And that plan they agreed with one another. This word, to agree with one another, is the same that you have in the word symphony. They were really in harmony with one another. They had a plan and they agreed with one another. But this is not what God wants us to do. Uh, Paul uses the same verb in 2 Corinthians 6 and he says what, or the same word, what kind of agreement is there between Belial, that is Satan, and Christ? There is no agreement. So here they made an agreement, but in actual fact they made agreement with the devil. As they, were, they allowed themselves to be controlled by Satan, as we have seen earlier. And so this kind of agreement is not something that we should follow. We sh rather should agree with the Lord and be under His control, under the control of the Holy Spirit. And then the consequence was that also um, Sapphira died and she was buried. She also expired, sold out. And when the young man came, they found her dead and having carried her out, they buried her by her husband. So this was God's judgment. There's a very solemn verse. Peter, later he wrote an epistle, second, uh, first and second epistle of Peter. And in 1 Peter 4, verse 17, he says, Judgment begins by the house of God. This is an example of what, he, what happened here, that is, this point, judgment begins with the house of God. God is going to judge the whole world. But he starts judgment with the house of God. Is there something not in order? And we try to cover it up, like Ananias and Sapphira did. God will not take that lightly. Now, of course, we live at the end of the church. But it doesn't mean that God's thoughts have changed. God's a holy God. And God is light. But we see also that God is patient. He gives us time. So if we have sinned, He gives us time to repent. But we need to repent, we need to confess, and then we can be restored. But here at the beginning, God judged right away to show how serious this matter was. Right at the beginning of this new testimony, God made it very evident that this was a very serious matter. Now, a few observations before we move on in the chapter. Uh, we see here also an example of Peter's authority. Uh, perhaps you remember in Matthew 16 that the Lord had given the keys of the kingdom to Peter to open and to close, or to bind and to lose. And that is the example that we find here with Peter, that he could bind and other cases could lose, permit, or allow. As we see other examples later in Acts that Peter used this authority to have believers come in from the Samaritans, believers from the Gentiles in the home of Cornelius in chapter 10. Peter used that authority that the Lord had given him. Here he used it to bind. Later on he will use it to lose. That is one observation. And then another thought I wanted to not to forget why was God's judgment so harsh? This is a divine punishment, but it says the begin, at the beginning of a new testimony. I gave the example of Achan in Joshua 7. He was stoned to death. 
Um, another example is when the service in the tabernacle started with Aaron and his sons, then two of his sons brought in, brought in strange fire. They used fire that God had not decreed. God had given orders to use the fire of the altar, the burnt offering altar, and they used another kind of fire. And God struck them. They were struck by fire from the Lord. That was a very serious judgment because that is at the beginning of a new uh, testimony, a new faith in God's uh, ways. And so God takes that very serious. Now if God does not do this today, if we have lied and He does not kill us right away, that is His grace, that is His patience. But I am afraid that we all have been uh, guilty of this kind of behavior of hypocrisy and lying as Ananias and Sapphira did. But if we notice that, we need to repent and to confess this right away. That is the lesson we can draw from this. And also we see here the recognition of Peter's authority as an apostle. That goes together with the keys that he had received. And so we can learn many lessons from this holiness that belongs to God's house. Uh, that judgment start with God's house, as I quoted that verse from First uh, Peter. And the effect was, in verse 11, that great fear came upon all the assembly, and upon all who heard these things. So this was a shock, but it had a healthy uh, effect, of course, on all the others. And then, we see that the apostles had liberty to go on with the, with the work. Through Ananias and Sapphira's behavior, perhaps the work had, had become stagnant. And now this matter was clear, and now we see that by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders done. These signs and wonders were given by the Lord. We remember that the Lord Jesus is now in the glory, and He works from the glory. As the Lord Jesus himself had done signs and wonders on this earth, he had healed the lepers to show that he was the Messiah, he had healed the blind to show that he was the Messiah, and many other miracles. These miracles really uh, authenticated his ministry. The mission that he had to proclaim that he was the Messiah, that message was supported by those signs and wonders that the Lord Jesus did. And in Acts 2, verse 23, we have seen that God approved him through these signs and wonders. God used these signs and wonders to show, hey, look, this is the Messiah. And now, the Lord Jesus, who was rejected by his own people on this earth, he is now in heaven, and he works through the hands of the apostles to do the similar signs and wonders. These signs and wonders, they showed that these apostles represented the rejected Messiah who is now in heaven. We have seen in Acts 2 verse 36 that God has made him Lord and Christ. And so these signs, they meant something, they indicated these come from the one who has authority. The wonders were so spectacular they drew the attention of the people. And there is another word that is not used here, um, it also is implies Power. This was the manifestation of power that the apostles received from the Lord in the glory. And so, the Lord worked in a mighty way. Um, today, He is able to do the same uh, signs and wonders, but today we have the Word of God, and the Lord Jesus wants the Word of God to be used, that we would believe it. If people want only signs and wonders, it's like what uh, Abram said to the rich man. You remember the story in Luke uh, 16, the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus died and he was in Abram's bosom and then the rich man died and he was in pain, in torment, and then he cried out to Abram, send Lazarus that he may give me some relief, some, some uh, water on my tongue. And then Abram said that cannot be because there is a rift between us. We cannot bridge that and so then he said, well, send someone to my brothers. I have five brothers. 
send them a message that they may believe that they will not come into this pain, this pain where I am. And you know what Abram said? They have the scriptures. If they don't believe the scriptures, in this case Moses' writings, they will not believe even if someone would rise from among the dead. And that is very solemn, very serious, because that shows you can get so many signs and wonders as you want, but if you don't believe the scriptures, those signs and wonders have no significance. They may even be the work of the, of the enemy, because the enemy is God's counterfeiter. The enemy can also work signs and wonders. So, this is an important test. Here the signs and wonders were given by God, and also by the Lord Jesus in the glory, to confirm the message of the apostles. But once that message was settled and the word of God was completed, that doesn't mean that God cannot again, <coughs> use signs and wonders. Of course, He is free to do that anytime He wants. But He wants people to believe the scriptures that He has given. That is a very important message. Then we see um, in verse 12 at the end that the the believers, they were in, of one accord in Solomon's porch. They continued to get together and gather to listen to the teaching of the apostles. And then verse 13 says, but of the rest. And that's an important statement. Of the rest, there is no man join them. What does that mean? The rest here is an expression, it's a bit of a technical expression. It means the others who were not believers. That is what it means here. You have uh, the same term used in Ephesians 2 verse 3, the rest who has no hope. Or when Paul speaks about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4, um, he also speaks about the rest referring to the unbelievers. So sometimes the rest in the scripture, depending on the context, refers to unbelievers. Sometimes the rest is the remnant, the remnant of believers. But here in this verse, the rest means those who are unbelievers. But they were so afraid about what happened that they did not even dare to join them. However, in verse 14 we see there were believers who were attracted to this new company. They believed and they were added to the Lord. You see, the Lord continued His work and that is in verse 14. So that is another remnant. Verse 13 is the rest, the unbelieving remnant. Verse 14 is the believing remnant. They were more and more added to the Lord. And notice what this says, they were added to the Lord. The Lord is adding. And that confirms what they just said. The Lord from the glory was giving these miracles. <coughs> and the Lord was speaking to people. And the Lord was adding to this company. They were not added to a group. They were not added to a denomination. They were added to the Lord. That is very important. The Lord is trying to draw people to Himself so that those who believe may be added to Him. And in fact, there were multitudes that were added, both of men and women. And the people around them, I want to mention, not forget that in verse 13 at the end, the people magnified them. A bit later in this chapter we have read that um, the officer, or the, the temple guard, wanted to get the, the apostles from prison and they were already released by the angel and they were already in the temple and then the officer came and he tried to get them but he did not use violence because he was afraid that the people would stone them. There's the same thought. The people who were unbelievers but they respected these believers very much. Uh, similar to the popularity that the Lord Jesus had in his earthly ministry. A lot of people did not believe in him, but he was very popular. And if people would try to, uh, to do harm to the Lord, then the people would not allow that. And the, lead, the religious leadership, we can read it in the Gospel, they were very afraid of the multitudes because of that. The same situation here. But this does not mean that uh, the people magnified them, that the people also believed. They only they honored this new testimony, they respected it, but they were not believers, sad to say. But it is a good point, because the Lord wants us also to have a good testimony 
uh, as far as those who are around. If the people around in the street where we live say, oh, those are crooked people, you know, you better stay away from them. That's not a good testimony. So here we see they had a very good testimony by the others uh, who were outside. And then in verse 15, this, there is now a description. We saw earlier, earlier a summary in verse 12 about the signs and wonders that the apostles did. And here is now an example given of that in verse 15. They brought out the sick into the streets and put them on beds and couches that at, at least the shadow of Peter when he came might overshadow some of them. I don't know whether that is superstition, but God used Peter in a mighty way that many people got healed. And in, it was even so popular that in verse 16 we read that many came from other cities in, uh, around Jerusalem and brought sick persons and persons beset by unclean spirits who were all healed. It's amazing. All were healed. That never happens today when there are popular healers. They have selected a few people who may perhaps be healed. We don't know. In many cases not. But here... All were healed. That is the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Lord in the glory. Wonderful testimony. And in verse 17, we see now the reaction. We have seen in chapter 3, the leadership rejected Peter's message. In chapter 4, it became more evident. And here it's even getting worse. They rose up. So that's already their um, hostility. And all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees. So these were the ones who rejected the resurrection. And they rejected this new message. And they were filled with jealousy. Very similar to when the Lord was on this earth. The leadership of the Jews was filled with jealousy. Because the Lord was so popular. And they were afraid that they would lose the control over the people. And they were very jealous and even Pilate, we read in the Gospels, Pilate knew that they had delivered him out of jealousy. Now here we see the same jealousy is still there. Now the Lord is in the glory. But they have the same animosity against him, now against his people who represent him. And so they laid hands on the apostles and put them in the public prison. But this is very interesting now that the angel of the Lord came. This is an interesting expression in verse 19. Before I forget, they were filled with jealousy. <clears throat> Just like um, the, the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit, here the enemy is filled with jealousy. Or also controlled by Satan. Just like the believer, Ananias, and the believer, Sapphira, had allowed themselves to be controlled by Satan, although they were believers, here we see unbelievers who were also controlled by Satan. And there, Satan used their jealousy to control them. So, Satan uses many different tools to control people. We should not forget that. And then, we see God's response. He sent the angel, or an angel of the Lord. In the Old Testament, this expression refers really to the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is the angel of the Lord. Because the angel of the Lord is Jehovah, and he represents Jehovah. And so, it could be that this expression here also refers to the angel of the Lord, and that would be the Lord Jesus himself. He is Jehovah. He is the angel of the Lord. But he is also as man in the glory. And I mention this to show the greatness of the person of the Lord, which is really a mystery. God and man in one. How he is as a man in the glory, and he is also Jehovah. He is also God. And he acted here through his angel. And the result was that they were led out. And I just want to comment on that uh, word, to be led out. This word is often used as um, leading out of captivity. Uh, the book of Exodus, that we know in the Old Testament, that speaks about the exodus of the people out of bondage, that word exodus is from the same root word as here in this word, um, leading out. Here they were led out. And I em emphasize that because that is one of the key words in the book of Acts. Acts has many different key words, but that is one of them. And that is this idea of leading out. God's purpose was to lead his people out of bondage in the past from Egypt. 
But now the people was again in bondage, but in a new way. They were now in bondage under the leadership, not only of the Romans, that was one form of bondage, but they were also in bondage of the religious leadership, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And here we see that the Lord led his people out of this bondage. It's an example, it's an object lesson, how the apostles were led out of that bondage is an object lesson what God had in mind he wanted to lead the believers out of bondage of the Sadducees later with Peter in prison in Acts 12 it's especially be set free from the uh, opposition of the Herodians and the Pharisees and so this is a theme all through this book uh, in Luke 24 we see that the Lord Jesus after his resurrection he led the disciples out out of Jerusalem, out of this religious system, to Bethany. And so this leading out is a central theme in the book of Acts. And today for us, the Lord wants to lead us out any form of bondage. If we are in bondage, whatever form it may be, the Lord wants to lead us out because the Lord wants to set us free. He doesn't want us to be controlled by whatever it may be. He only wants us to be controlled by Him by His Word and by His Spirit. And so He wants to open the doors also for us. Are we stuck behind a door? Whatever door it may be, the Lord wants us to open such a door so that we will not be blocked. But of course that goes together with what we said earlier, the need for repentance and confession. And here, the angel, as I said already earlier, represents the Lord himself, who wants to lead his people out. And then the angel says, go. That is an action verb. And then, standing, in the middle of verse 20, take your stand. Keep standing. And then, speak. There are three words. Go, so he was leading out, that is one thing. But we have to go. He wants to lead us out, but if we don't want to go, there's where it stops. You see how God's work and our work go together. He was leading them out, but they had to go. And he says, go. And they did. They were obedient. He said, take your stand there in the midst of the temple. And they did. They didn't say, oh, that's too dangerous. No, they did. And they spoke all the words of this life. That's a beautiful expression. They were representatives of the Lord in the glory. He is the living, the Prince of Life. And His words are living words. And so they had the privilege to represent Him who gives living words. And uh, we as believers, we have also great privilege. In Philippians 2 verse 15, it says that we may hold the word of life. We may be a testimony in this world to represent this word of life in our daily lives. And so they did. They obeyed. They did not hesi uh, hesitate. And in verse 21, there they are, early in the morning, standing there and teaching in the temple. Just like the Lord had done before. That's another lesson we can learn. As the Lord was marked by prayer in the Gospels, and also teaching the people, so in the book of Acts, His people are marked by prayer, and the, the apostles are teaching. Especially Peter and John, of course. And later Paul, they are marked by teaching, praying and teaching. And then during the, in the morning hour, not before 9 o'clock, because the session did not start before 9 o'clock in the morning, there the high priest came and the whole council, and now they were going to consider what they would do with these people. And what did they find out? They were no longer in prison. Well, then they were very embarrassed. They didn't even believe in angels. And God had used an angel to lead them out of the prison. They didn't believe in resurrection. But the Lord, the risen Lord from heaven, had led them out. It's amazing. So, now they were really at their wit's end. And so, they sent the captain of the temple and the chief priest. And in verse 25, when he heard that message, and then the captain went, he brought them, but not with violence, and he set them in front of the council. Verse 27. 
And then the high priest asked this question in verse 28. We strictly enjoined you not to teach in this name. He had given orders. But we have, seen, we have seen already earlier in chapter 4 that Peter and John said, you be the judge. If it is a matter of God's authority or your authority, which authority should we follow? God is higher. These leaders had received authority from the Lord. They had, he had delegated authority to them. But if the delegated authority conflicts with God himself, who is the source of all authority, then we have to go back to God and honor him and obey him. That's what Peter explained in chapter 4. And we get here the same lesson again. They had commanded something, but Peter and John and the apostles could not follow this commandment. It doesn't mean that the apostles wanted to be disobedient to the authorities, but if the authorities are in conflict with God, then they have to obey God first. But these leaders, what do they say in verse 28? You have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. And you plan to bring upon us the blood of this man. Notice here, they don't even want to pronounce the name of the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua. They don't want to use his name even. They only say this man. They had said his blood over us and our children. In Matthew 27, you can read that. And now... They re perhaps they remind they, they remember that and you say they say now you bring the blood over us what well, they had cried out his blood over us it would come in year 70 they would all be killed and the temple would be destroyed it would come over them but now it was still a time of grace a time of waiting that God gave a period of 40 years that God was patient with them if they would repent from their attitude but Peter says, and I hinted upon that already in verse 29, God must be obeyed rather than man. That's an important lesson for us also. That is not to say that we should disobey the authorities. It's very clear. Romans 13 shows that we need to be obedient to the authorities, the federal, provincial, municipal authority that God has put over us. But when these authorities ask something that would right away conflict with God's authority, then we have to follow God's authority. <clears throat> In verse 30, The God of our fathers has raised up Jesus, whom ye have slain, hang, having hanged on a cross. So we have seen that already a couple of times that Peter had referred to it, what the leadership had done. They had also done it, of course, with the help of the Romans, because they were not allowed at that moment to execute uh, people. And Peter here emphasizes what they had done in their responsibility. That does not excuse the Romans, but it is to emphasize what they had done in their responsibility. They were more responsible for what they had done than the Romans. And in contrast to what they had done, rejecting the Messiah, God had exalted the Messiah. And the Messiah here is called leader or captain. It's a beautiful term that shows the greatness of the Lord Jesus. He is the Savior and He is the one who is in authority. The great captain and leader and prince. That is a wonderful name that the Lord Jesus has. And he was exalted by God's right hand. So that shows God's power. It shows also that he is placed in a position of favor and honor by God. And in verse 32, we are his witnesses of these things. So of the fact that the Lord Jesus was risen by God's right hand, but also that he was exalted by God's right hand. They were witnesses of these things. And the Holy Spirit also, which God has given to those that obey him. So also the Holy Spirit, because he is a divine person that came from heaven on behalf of the Lord Jesus in the glory, he gives this uh, testimony through the mouths of the believers, of course. And speaking to the, those that obey him. Obedience and faith go together. It is Romans that makes that very clear. The obedience of faith. So you could read it this way. At the end of verse 32. 
that God has given to those that believe in Him. And because they believe in Him, they obey. In verse 33, they, when they heard these things, were cut to the heart. So this is the response. They were, uh, it's like they were stabbed. They, they were, they were, there was a sword going through their heart, as it were. This is the same word that is used after Stephen's message in chapter 7, when Stephen had said at the end, you have always, generation after generation, you have hardened yourself against God. So these people had hardened themselves, and they, in, in that sense they were cut to the heart. It was as if a sword went to their heart. But instead of repenting, they hardened themselves even more. And so they took counsel to kill them. Just as they had done during the ministry of the Lord on this earth, and then had taken counsel to kill him, to get him executed, now they take counsel to execute his representatives, his disciples. And so also today to make this application are many believers who are being persecuted, but it's the same animosity that we find here. People who are controlled by Satan, who try to kill the believers. In verse 34, at this critical moment, that the lives of all the apostles, the twelve apostles, were in great danger, that they would be executed. At that moment, God uses a Pharisee. Perhaps you remember that the council of the Jews, 71 members, include, including the high priest, consisted of Sadduceans, they were the priests and the high priests, and also uh, scribes, but also a good number of Pharisees. And these Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were always in disagreement with one another. We will see that later in chapter 23, very clearly. And now God uses a Pharisee, who is really an opponent of the Sadducees, and they listen to him. So God uses this Pharisee, he was not a believer, but he was a man greatly respected by the people. He was like Nicodemus. You know the story of Nicodemus in John 3? He was at that moment the teacher of Israel. He was in a very high position as a teacher of the law. And here, this time, Gamaliel was a very well-known teacher of the law and respected by the people. Just as the people had respected the believers, as we saw earlier in verse uh, 13 and 14, so, we see here, the believers were, excuse me, the people in general, they honored the teacher Gamaliel. That is the respect they had for him. And so he uh, commands them to put the apostles outside for a while. In the meantime, he gives them a counsel. This counsel is very simple. His reasoning is, see, if someone rises up and is a follow, has a following, uh, let us consider what it is. If it is not of God, then we have to deal with it. But if it, of God, if it is of God, suppose that these twelve, and that's his argument, suppose that these twelve people that you want to kill, suppose that they are really God's servants. If you kill them, you are killing God's servants. So, you better be careful what you do. That's what he's saying. He's not saying, I'm also a believer. I also want to follow the Messiah. He's not saying that at all. He's only using human uh, tact and human uh, sense. Instead of, he's not really carried away by this jealousy and by this hatred. He's just reasoning. And it makes sense. If you kill these people, and suppose they are followers of, of God, you are, you, are, you are killing God's uh, representatives, so you cannot do that. You better wait and see. Just leave them alone, and let's see if this is really of God. Now, sadly, we don't have any report that later Gamaliel really became a believer. But we see later in this book that many Pharisees also became believers. And even the Sadducees who rejected the message, we will see later that many of them also came to believe. That is God's grace. But we, we will see that later in this book. And so the conclusion of Gamaliel was to leave them alone, 
because they had to wait and see if this was of God or not. And so they listened to him, and in verse 41, therefore they went their way from the council, so now the disciples were let go, and what do we see in verse 41? They were rejoicing. Why were they rejoicing? That they were counted worthy to be dishonored for the name. That is something. To rejoice because you suffer for the name. Notice here, the name. What does that mean? It's the name of the Lord Jesus. The name. In Third John, the third epistle of John, he speaks about believers, workers, um, witnesses, who have gone out for the name. That is the same thought. They have gone out to preach for the name of the Lord Jesus. They represent the name. And here the disciples, the, the twelve apostles, they represented the name, that is the Messiah, the Lord Jesus in heaven, who is absent from this earth but has all authority. The name is connected with authority. And they were counted worthy to be dishonored because of the name. So they rejoiced in that. They identified so with the name, with the Lord Jesus, that whatever happened to them, they accepted it. Later in First Peter, I referred earlier to First Peter, that judgment begins with the house of God. There are other scriptures in First Peter that speak about suffering. That the people of God, they suffer now in God's school, chapter 1. They suffer unjustly because this world is unjustly, so the believers who suffer, suffer unjustly. But then in chapter 3, he speaks about suffering for righteousness sake. And in chapter 4, he speaks about suffering for the name. And that is what you find here. They were suffering for the name. So they were truly overcomers. They had the spiritual vigor to withstand the enemy. And they, as a result of that, they suffered, but it was for the name. In 1 Peter 5, we see suffering also because of Satan's hostility. And that is also a form of suffering that we see in Acts. That Satan wants to wipe this testimony out and therefore there is suffering. And so these forms of suffering are also found today for the believers. And further result is in verse 42, every day in the temple and in the houses they ceased not teaching. Every day. It is remarkable how many times we find that expression daily or every day in this book. Uh, later we'll see the Bereans, they were searching or examining the scriptures every day, daily, to see if these things were so. So may we take an example of this, to search the scriptures daily in connection with this teaching and also to announce the glad tidings, preach the gospel. I've read once of a brother who made a covenant with the Lord. He would not let one day go by that he would not speak the glad tidings to someone else. So he, was a gospel, he was a real evangelist. But it is a challenge for all of us to do an effort and to make such a commitment to announce on a daily basis the name of the Lord Jesus as glad tidings. That Jesus was the Christ. Here, of course, in this setting, it is the Jewish setting. The Jews have rejected that the Lord Jesus is the Messiah. But these Jewish believers, they proclaimed as good message that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. And John's Gospel was written for that very fact, that Jesus is the Christ. That was the reason for John's Gospel, to show that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So this is a wonderful chapter. And there was one more thing in closing that I wanted to mention. Um, Earlier we have seen that they were in one accord, in verse 12. They were all with one accord, and I want to close with that uh, point. The harmony that was there. We saw earlier there was harmony in evil with Ananias and Sapphira. They agreed, they had a symphony together, they agreed together, but that was not a good harmony. Here we see an example of a good harmony, one accord. And that expression of one accord is used six times for the believers in the book of Acts. It is one accord in prayer. It is one accord in fellowship in chapter 2. It's one accord another time in prayer in chapter 4. We saw that the last time. Here it is in one accord in testimony here in chapter 5 verse 12. They were all with one accord in Solomon's port. So that is as a testimony. Later we see 
the Samaritans, they were of one accord with Philip, who had preached the gospel. And in chapter 15, when there is a great conflict in Jerusalem, we'll see that in chapter 15, we see that the conflict was resolved and they were of one accord when he wrote that letter. And in Romans 15, there is the seventh time that believers are seen in one accord, to glorify the God and Father of one accord. There are seven times in the New Testament that this term is used for believers. Four times for unbelievers. So that's just a little detail, but so that shows how every word, every expression is important. I cannot uh, emphasize that enough. So we have really to read the scriptures not only on a daily basis, but word by word, to, to really grasp God's thoughts. And also to see that the same word sometimes has a different meaning. In this case I mentioned seven times it's used in connection with believers, four times in connection with unbelievers. And so the same term can have a different meaning depending on the context. So that is another rule that we have to learn when we study the scriptures. So let's encourage one another to search the scriptures and also to follow the example of these early believers. So if there is a question or something, a comment uh, in closing, then we can do that and then we can close with him in a prayer. <coughs> Clarify the difference in verse 42 between teaching and preaching. Yeah, that's a good question. A teaching is to explain from the scriptures the truth. And that is for believers. The preaching, <coughs> in this case, the word preaching means presenting the good news. And so that is here for unbelievers. They, there were many Jews who did not believe yet that... Jesus is the Messiah. And so in, th in this context, this preaching is for unbelievers. But it is the preaching of the good news. You have the same thing in the very last verse of of Acts, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. What difference was that? The very last verse of Acts. Yeah, exactly. Acts 28, verse 31, I think. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that is a good example also of the balance. Paul was a teacher, but he was also an evangelist. And both things need to go on together. The teaching for the believers and the good news for the unbelievers. We need both. Would you say they're different gifts? Definitely. But if we need both. One doesn't necessarily yeah. have the other. Exactly. Yeah. But if you need both. The church, yeah. church needs both. Yeah. phrase proclaiming the good news is that the same root where we would get evangelism from yeah, yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. evangelize mm Other questions? Or comments? <coughs> but I found it striking the passage that Joel read at the beginning where Peter failed, he went out, but he failed. Here we see he went out, but he did not fail. He really relied on the Lord while the storm was raging. Yeah. It's a beautiful example. May the Lord help us to follow Peter's example.